Praise the Lord. Blessed morning, everyone. Everyone's having a good service so far. It's time for our spiritual meal. And so we want to make sure that it's God who's going to speak to us today. So I want to surrender it all to him. Heavenly Father, in the name of your glorious son, Jesus Christ, I thank you for this amazing privilege of delivering your word to your flock. I ask you, Lord, to be the one to speak through me and speak into every heart and mind, including my own, and give us special revelation today of what it, what it is you're sharing with us. Thank you for already giving me revelation on a whole nother subject today. But help, help me focus on just delivering your word and help us all be ready, be prepared to absorb it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, let's go with our opening verse. Uh, well, so I think it was Tuesday morning, Pastor Tyrone was giving the word of the day, and a few things started standing out. It was it, it, the subject was in the latter rain, I believe it was. And, and, and uh, you know, the when we are first born again, we have this amazing blessing when we're in God's presence. And that is that early rain experience that we as born again Christians experience. You know God is real and you have no issues, no concerns. You have, you're just in paradise and you feel like you're being carried like a little child. But then all of a sudden that starts to change and we start wondering what's going on and we start facing trials and tribulations and we don't understand. And so the early rain, when it comes to uh, being in, in the way of cultivating things, the early rain softens up that soil that it can be plowed and seeded and worked. And so God gave us that early rain in our hearts to get us ready for all the work that he's going to do inside of us. Right. He's going to plow, he's going to dig, he's going to put seeds in, he's going to let things grow, he's going to prune, oh, ouch, ooh. And he's going to let these things happen. But ultimately, the next season comes, and that's the latter rain. And that rain really produces the real fruit, the flowers and the fruit and the vegetables and everything else once everything has been prepared. And so that was, I, when I heard latter rain, I was already getting excited because I know that's what God's plan is for us in the very near future. But some of the supporting scripture that he had even got me more of my attention, and one of those is right here, our opening scripture today. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you, all of you, worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. The lot said there, but what we're going to focus on is this last verse right here. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in each and every one of us. Amen? That's our topic today. Christ glorified in his saints. Praise the Lord. We are chosen to bring him glory and not ourselves. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so how does that work? How does that look? Let's see if we can see God's ways and how he will glorify himself in his saints. Ready? Amen. All right. Well, first, we want to know that. Well, Jesus came first and he set the path, the example, and said, follow me, right? So we look at Jesus and we know that Jesus didn't come here for any other reason but that God, his father, would be glorified. Amen? That's what he wanted to do. In John chapter 12, verses 27 through 30, Jesus says, now my soul is troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. This is exactly what Jesus was here to do. 
glorify his father's name, Amen. right? He didn't even come to glorify himself, yet he was glorified. Notice in our opening verse that Christ may be glorified us in us, and also that we would be glorified in him. But that's not our focus. Our focus, just like Jesus, is to glorify Jesus, for in our case, and he was to glorify the Father. Amen? Amen. All right, so... The, then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Praise the Lord. God is, in, he knew that everything was in the Father's hands. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it uh, said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Amen. Amen. Because they have a relationship already. But he says these things so they can hear it and understand why. So we can follow him. Amen. Mm -hmm. And understand what's happening and what we are called to do as well. Praise the Lord. Jesus glorified the Father by dying the self. This is not just about dying on a cross. Because that's, that's great. That probably glorifies the Father. But that really was a gift for us. Amen. That was a gift for us. But the dying of self is much deeper than that. John 6, 38, Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Amen? So he did not come here to have his own plans and do his own things and accomplish things. He came to fulfill everything that his father, God the Father, wanted him to do, ultimately, to go to the cross, but there were many other things, and that was his sole focus. Amen? Amen. John 5, 19, Jesus also made it clear right here. Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. He is spirit-led. He knows that on his own strength, or trying to defend, or anything else, it's not going to work. It's just, it's futile. It's actually the opposite of what God wants. God, God is going to be glorified by him placing everything in God's hands and doing God's will. And then whenever he hears, he speaks. I mean, even when we see in Isaiah where it talks about the Sabbath, not doing your own pleasure nor speaking your own words, yeah. right? Just rest in him and he will give you the words to speak. Amen. Amen. Then we know it's God and God is glorified and we're blessed. Praise the Lord. John 5 30. I can of myself do nothing, Jesus says. This is Jesus talking, not just some guy walking down the block. As I hear, I judge. So what he hears not from around him, but from the Father, that's where he makes judgments in the sense that he speaks the words of judgment on people. And ultimately, it's to bring repentance. Amen. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Amen. So his sole focus, blinders on, tunnel vision, is to do God's will. Praise the Lord. So that that all that glorifies the Father and not him. Amen. Amen. Even though he ends up being glorified and we also end up being glorified. Now, Jesus was the image of the Father. Why do I say that? We know man was created in the image of God, but Jesus was created in the image of the Father. John 14, he was pure without sin. We may be created in the image of God, but we got plenty of the devil in us too. Yeah, because we got this flesh that was born of sin. Amen. So it's John 14, verses 7 through 11. If you had known me, you would, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. So he's saying, come on, show us the father. Let, let's see him. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? That's the father speaking through him, right? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? If you have one, a visual image of what the Father looks like, you look at Jesus, not the 
beard and the, how he stood, but everything about his nature is the nature of the Father, is the nature of God. He was patient and kind and gentle, yet strong when it was correction, or even stronger if it was, again, uh, some enemy of God, right? Amen. And so, if you want to see the Father, you look at Jesus, and you can see the whole Father's personality and everything else. Amen. Because he came from God, amen? All right. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. There it is again. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. He recognized that everything came from the Father. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sakes of the works themselves. He's doing signs and wonders. That's how he got, God got everybody's attention that this is my son. He came from me. Because no human being could do those things. Moses was the same way. He came to us doing, doing signs and wonders. But they were, you know, turning his rod into a snake and the river into blood and pestilence, all that. But now Jesus comes and heals the blind and the sick. And, and you, you know all the miracles. And so those works themselves declare that they are one. Amen? Are we okay? Amen. Another important point. Excuse me. All right. Another important point is that now we're watching all this because we are followers of Jesus. So we want to understand his walk and his experience so we can follow him. And all that he did, we have to remember that he offended the religious leaders of his day. And the religious leaders of his day were scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, and those people, right? They were supposed to be the people who knew God. Uh, and so he was an offense to them. And um, you'll see why I'm at including this. Mark 2, verses 3 through 12. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through the roof, uh, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> the Pharisees got all uptight about this. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak black blasphemies like this? Who can forgive, forgive sins but God alone? Amen? Amen. Um. You'll see how all this fits later. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit, uh, spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all. This is no paralytic. He can't move, no nothing for who knows, their whole life, or at least most of their life. So that all were amazed. And what happened? They glorified God. Amen? Here's a perfect example of how God is glorified through Jesus and how Jesus can be glorified through his saints. Amen? Amen. Saying, we never saw anything like this. And there was another example right here, uh, John 10, verses 22 through 39. That was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, as, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple on, in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. 
and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Amen. 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 And look what happened. In the moment he says that, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And when you stone someone, you're finishing them off. Amen? The I, that's killing him. That's what they wanted to do. Jesus answered them, many good works I have shown you from my Father. Again, he's giving the Father glory. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. Amen? Amen. So he is living to glorify the Father, and he is getting persecuted for considering himself equal to God in a sense, right? Amen. He's of God. He is, we know he is God in the flesh. And so all this is coming, going to make a full circle by the time we're done. Are we okay? Jesus answered them, it is not, is it not written in your, in your law? I said, you are God's. And that comes out of, I believe, the book of Psalms. I'm not, uh, I have to verify. But, so even there, it says that the children of God are God's. Small g, because they're not the God, right? If he called them God's to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him who cannot be broken do you say of him whom the father sanctified and sent into the world you are blaspheming because i because i said i am the son of god this is interesting because i've never really noticed this before but he says the father sanctified you say of him whom the father sanctified and sent into the world it's like god prepared him and made him pure and sinless right even though he wasn't sinful before but that even Jesus calls himself sanctified and then brought into the world. This is going to become interesting as we keep going. All right. Amen. Praise the Lord. If I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. Again, he keeps pointing to the father. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the father is in me and I in him. Therefore, they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand, not because he was physically strong or a fast runner, but because it wasn't his time. Amen? Sure it's just not going to happen unless God says it's going to happen. That's all you got to know. No one has any power over anyone unless God allows it. Amen? Amen. A whole army of 200 million can come against him, and if it's not time, it's not going to happen. Praise the Lord. Are you still with me? Amen. So Jesus comes forth and he does all these things and then he gets nailed to a cross and he dies, goes into a tomb and is resurrected three days later. And what happens next? He goes and sits at the right hand of the Father, right? Amen. Acts chapter 2, verses 32 through 36. This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. These are the disciples, now apostles. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, there he is at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Amen? Till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Amen? Praise the Lord. So, just uh, had some scripture to make sure we all understand. God came. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, or was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word will go forth and accomplish what it set out to do, and will not return void. Amen? Mm -hmm. So, the Word became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, and he walked on this earth for approximately 33 years, and accomplished everything the father wanted to accomplish and then when he was done 
he came and sat at the right hand of the Father and rested. Amen? Praise the Lord. Who sits or stands at the right hand of the king? That's my question here. We, we're not living in the days of kings in every country or whatever, every, every nation. But there's still a few left, I guess. And so let's look at what the Bible says about who has the privilege of being at the right hand of the king. Amen? Psalm 45, verses 6 through 9 says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your compa companions. All your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces by which they have made you glad. King's daughters are among your honorable women. At your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. Amen? Amen. Now, I don't have the scripture of the story of Esther, but Esther, uh, in a nutshell, is one of many virgins brought to the king. And each one would go to see the king each day. And the one that pleased him would become the queen. And we see that there was a selected one named Esther. Uh, and so she was selected. And the only thing that set her apart from everyone else is the fact that she left the decision-making to the one who was leading her instead of her own. She didn't choose anything of her own. That's someone who sold out to the will of God, amen? Mm -hmm. And we know Jesus was, so he he is the select one. He And Esther is a type of Jesus that becomes the queen. Now we say, oh, wait, hold on a second. Uh, we're calling Jesus a queen? What, what kind of is this new day, new age stuff here? <laughs> no. No, the queen is the bride of the king. And so let's see if God shows us this story. Uh, actually, I know most of you know this, but maybe someone new here or uh, listening to this online now or in the future um, will get some revelation here. Because uh, this was a revelation that God gave me when there was some confusion about the relationship between the Father and the Son. Because it's not a clear thing, right? The Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and how does all that work? But remember that human beings are made in the image of God. Everything in creation that we see, smell, and, and visualize and touch is a physical manifestation of a spiritual thing. And so God already gave us an example of this relationship. And that is Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 24. I'm going to go through it. A little quickly, because I know that most of this crowd already knows this story. But it's relevant to what we're sharing today. And the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable him to him. And so if we think of God the Father, and he's just there, maybe it's not good for him to be alone. Amen? Amen. Maybe he is a God is love. God is all these great things, but how can you love nothing? There's nothing, right? So here he's telling a story with physical person of Adam. He makes him in his own image, but he's by himself. And he got a beautiful garden, but there's no one to share it with. There's no one to, to express all that love and mercy and kindness. Amen? So now he's going to make a helper equal to him. Out of the ground, the Lord for God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought it, them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Amen. Amen. So what if, what if God wants to share his wonderful creation, you know, everything, himself and everything. And, but, and, but he has no one to be with. So maybe he creates uh, angels and cherubim and seraphim and all these other helpers that do work like animals do in the farm. They're, they're all there to uh, help him accomplish what he wants to do, but none of them are really equal to God himself, right? They can't 
relate. They, his ways are so past understanding and so forth. They're not as wise. And so they're, they're nice to have, but he still feels alone. Amen? Adam still feels alone. He's got these animals and they're fun, but he has no one to really share it all with. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And the rib which the Lord God, now a rib is what they translated to, the word is curved. And we also know that our DNA is curved. And so we don't have to get too stuck on traditional ways. We can see that you can do things with DNA to replicate. And that's how even babies are formed with, and all of that, right? It's all the mixing of DNA. Uh, so the rib which the Lord God taken, he made in the woman and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So he was taken out of man. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word even tells us in the book of Psalms, Take out your right hand and make, make our enemies go away. You know, save us. Your right hand, they're always talking about it, from his own bosom, right? And so Eve came out of Adam's bosom. Well, the word came from God's bosom. The word spoke and things were created. And the word was brought forth and placed into a human being. And now that word is its own entity. But after that, he came back to the father and sat in his right hand. And the two become one. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. That's why they were so upset with Jesus, because he said that he was God. But the he gave us an example right here. The Lord is one because they are one as a husband and a wife. Amen. Right? Get it? You got that? Praise the Lord. I know it really helped me. And then we, we said, well, hold on a second. This is really getting crazy. You know, a guy and a guy and whatever and all that. The father and the son and all that. God is talking about spiritual things here, right? Yeah. Remember in Galatians 3.28, there is neither new, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. And I'm going to jump ahead. By the way, the church is the bride of Christ. And if you're a guy, deal with it. Amen? It's not about our, our we to Christ are also in the female sense of this marriage. Amen? Yeah. Because he is the head. And that's the whole foundation of all this. They're equal in all ways except headship itself. The, Jesus and the Father are equal in all ways except the Father has headship. Right? right. That's why he said no one knows the date or night. Uh, day or time but the father himself there are certain things the father still controls even though they're equal in all ways right amen and that's why in god's intention for a couple is not for one to step on the other one and control the other one equal in all ways but the responsibility and the ultimate decisions lay on the husband the father right amen. of a family because we're made in the image of god amen, amen. are we okay with this Praise the Lord. We're setting up something wonderful here. So stay with me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we've got the picture, right? Jesus, Jesus came to live for the Father. He came to glorify the Father. He did everything in God's will. And he was persecuted for it. But he did it. He showed us the way. Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5. Now we're going to see that repeating pattern now that Jesus is with the Father, and he's up there, right? He left, right? We see right here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. Right? I just talked about this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. So he's telling us now that the church is the woman in the relationship. Amen? But it's not like that dominating, you know, what we think of when people, especially, you know, someone takes this to, to literal meaning, I make all the decisions and I'm going to tell you, you know, that's not, it's supposed to be 
a combined relationship, but ultimately the husband is responsible for the ultimate decisions. And that's why he says, submit to your husband, right? And when the wife submits to the husband, she's not held responsible for incorrect decisions either, right? Yeah. The husband is, right? So, okay, here we go. And he's the savior of the body. We're also the body. The church is the bride. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. All right, Romans 8, chapter 28, verse th through 30. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For he, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. Now, this is really key here, okay? He predestined people to be conformed into the image of his son. He is in the image of the father. And now all of a sudden he's got people he's going to transform and conform into his image. We've been talking about the sanctification and how the goldsmith is going to keep putting the gold in there until he sees his own image. Amen. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. And then he was the firstborn among many. That's that's another big one, right? Hold on a second. Many what? Many Jesuses? Many sons of God? How, how does all this work? Moreover, whom he predestined, he, he, that these he also called. To whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Okay, remember our focus is glorifying God. And ultimately, the saints that glorify God are glorified as well. It's kind of mentioned here. Amen. All right. Signs of those who God predestines. And ultimately, it's all God's work. And that is definitely been highlighted to me today. Praise the Lord. All of it is his work. So we're just in a play that he is making out for himself. That's the bottom line. So for someone who is a saint that's God called to glorify him and to be glorified we'll see the same traits first of all they live to glorify jesus and die to self just like jesus right they don't have they're not living their life for their own gain or their own plans they when god calls they say you know i'm gonna i'm gonna give it all and live to glorify Jesus, Luke 9, verses 23 through 24. Then he said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Amen. Remember, Jesus came just to do the Father's will. And for those who God is calling, they are, they'll see this and they'll say, yeah, that's me. I give it all up, right? And then God will God'll test. God will reveal things and say, okay, are you willing to let this go? Are you willing to let this go? Are you willing to let this go in our walk? Amen? And then he gets people to go all the way. Praise the Lord. They yield to the work of the Spirit that will transform them into the image of Jesus. Amen? And so we, I know, I've personally seen many people who have uh, come and they've been on fire for God and doing great until God wants them to do something that's uncomfortable or have to give up something that they're not willing to give up, right? Yeah. And so then they decide to move or leave or whatever the case, right? So God, that's why God does the sifting and has a remnant and so forth. But again, this is all God's work. It's really remarkable. It's really incredible. Praise the Lord. And I hope we'll see more of this as it goes forward. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's God's work. And for those that he's going to glor that will glorify him and that he will glorify are the ones who are yes yielded to whatever it is needs to be surrendered. Amen? Mm -hmm. 
All right. Are we okay? Yeah. Yeah. So, news flash. We see the pattern of Jesus glorifying the Father and how he walked. And now we see that there are those who are willing to just live for God's will and follow Jesus all the way. Well, guess what? They, too, will offend the religious leaders of the day. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. It's just required. It's just the way it's going to be. In Mark 10, verses 29 through 30, Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels. Again, it doesn't mean we have to physically leave everybody and go out to a monastery or something, unless that's what God tells you to do. But it's a matter of surrendering everything to God and just living for his will. And usually it doesn't mean we have to leave anybody physically or especially family, I should say. Right. But whatever, whatever he says, however he wants to drive it. But it's a really a heart surrender. And he knows a man who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. This is his promise. And in the age to come, eternal life. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. All right. Are we okay? Amen. All right. John 20, verses 19 through 20. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. We see this pattern already here. So he came to glorify the Father. God had him things to do. Now he goes to the Father. And now we become the ones who are called to live for his will and follow him and do what he's asking us to do. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Guess what? If you forgive the sins of any, and they are, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Amen? Why did I include this here? What was Jesus persecuted for in our example? For saying he forgave the sins of the, the paralytic, right? Amen. And they got all upset. How can you forgive sins only god can do that jesus says now it's your turn and if you forgive the sins of any they're forgiven so those who follow him and are totally surrendered to him to glorify him have the power to forgive sins for a person and yet if that they do that they're going to receive persecution because you're acting as if you're god or you're a you're, are you Jesus or whatever? They're going to say all these things um, just like they did to Jesus. Amen? That's part of the persecution because once once the saints truly understand what's been given to them, and they, well, the more is going to be said here about that as we go forward. Now, he was born sinless. His saints were not. Amen? Because if he had to just, God just had to work with, the human beings already on this earth, he couldn't find a sinless person, right? Because we're all sinful. We all have sin. That's why Jesus had to be born specially like that, without sin. The rest of us are born in sin, so instead of being born sinless, we are made sinless. First, uh, second, uh, first Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 to 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify, which is to set you apart and you're, you're, you're walking in the commandments and everything. And sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. You see that? At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful who will also do it. Amen? Amen. The Israelites didn't believe that God can get them in the promised land. There were too many giants in there. We may hear this and say, oh, that's just not possible. I sin every day. How, that's just not possible. But God says he can do it. Amen? Amen. And those who believe made it. 
Right? Yeah. Those who didn't died in the wilderness. That doesn't mean mm-hmm. someone's not saved. It just means that they didn't weren't given the faith, I guess, to, to believe that God could say, do what he says he will. Amen. Are right, we okay? Amen. And then once he's sanctified his people and set them apart, his saints, then comes that blessing. Amen. This is where kind of the latter, latter rain comes in. Now we're gonna we've read this many times, but I think this is such an important chapter in the Bible with Jesus talking. And so we're gonna go through it slowly here. Most assuredly, Jesus said, Most most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, this is not, yes, Jesus was real, he's the Son of God, he died for my sins. Thank you. No, he who believes that I can do this work in you, who believes in me. That I can finish, I can cause you to be like me. The works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these, he will do because I go to my Father. Amen. Have we seen this? We well, we know anybody out there walking and doing greater works than Jesus Christ himself? Anyone? I haven't. I have not seen anyone work in that kind of power like he did. Amen? Amen. I've seen the miracles of God. I've seen healings and I've seen many things. But he's saying whoever believes in that finished work will do amazing things to you know so many people. People will be healed and delivered from demons and all that kind of stuff. And so I look forward to this myself. Praise the Lord. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Here we go. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. And that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And he who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. I want to do it, but I can't. But... We yield to his work, and guess what? All of a sudden, we become more and more like him, and we don't have any issues with keeping the commandments because we're walking in love. Amen? Amen? And that's what the commandments are. How to love God, how to love our neighbor. That's it. Praise the Lord. If we, and if we do it in love, love covers a multitude of sin. It doesn't matter if we touch something dirty or whatever. If we're walking in love, that's the important thing. Praise the Lord. And he who loves me will be loved my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. We all want that, right? Judas, not Iscariot, said, Lord, how is it you manifest yourself to us and not to the world? So people are looking for this coming of Christ. Now there is the coming of Christ at the very end. There's no question about that. But a second coming, those who eagerly await, he returns a second time apart from sin for salvation. Amen? Amen. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Amen? That's why greater things will be done. Not because we're like we're doing anything. It's because God comes in the form of a human. They were looking for God when they got offended at Jesus for saying your sins are forgiven. They said only God can do that. They didn't understand that God was standing right in front of them. Amen. Amen? But God doesn't fill a vessel that's not clean. And that's why God has to work in us first. Because he's got to prepare us to be a clean vessel, clean temple, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, whatever the Ark, right? where his presence is. So, um, okay. All right. Um, so he has to prepare his vessels and then 
occupy the presence of God. And so, again, the saints of God who have surrendered everything that he finishes that work, God will move in and God will speak through them and they will look at those people. Aren't you uh, that guy who drives Uber and aren't you this and that and all that? But but God is the one in them speaking, right? Amen. And that's that's why, why we have to die to ourselves. We have to be so empty of ourselves that now he moves in. And we're like a soup, you know? He just, because you can't see him, but he moves in and then all of a sudden, he moves through his saints. Amen. That's exactly what happened with the apostles. In my opinion, that's why they went from not being able to stay awake to pray to no, no more stumbling and sleeping and changing the whole world, right? There was just approximately 12 of them, right? And so uh, this is what I believe is going to happen with God's saints. Praise the Lord. And Jesus will be glorified. Romans 8, verses 18 and 19 says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time, and we relate, sufferings of this present time, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Amen? For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of who? The sons of God. Amen? There was the firstborn, there were the apostles of 2,000 years ago. And the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, there'll be 12 times 12,000 in the last days that God will bring him his true body, his presence, where he will just move through physical bodies that have been sanctified and prepared for him to occupy. Do we see this today? Amen? Amen. No, I mean, do we see it in Revelation? Do we see that this is possible? Yes. Amen. Well, we don't see it out there today, but I believe this is exactly what's going to happen soon. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. This will happen in the last days. That's a fact. I believe it. I mean, the word is clear. Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. This is a spiritual thing. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the, the earth and the sea saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Amen? Letting what tribulation, whatever you want to say, but things are going to get ugly in this world. But he is preparing a group of people that he is going to move in on so that when everything else is happening, Psalm 91, those who abide in the under the wings of the Almighty, will only see the reward of the wicked, but it will not come near them. But they will be there as a city on a hill with their arms wide open that cannot be hidden. For all those who will be struggling and suffering out there, they will see God, not people, and not, not IT personnel and all that. They're going to see God moving through human bodies and guiding them to himself. Amen? Praise the Lord. Matthew 16, verses 27 and 28, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he will reward each according to his works. I say to you that there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I believe that we see that manifested in the apostles. He had to leave first, and then... 40, 40 days he was with them and uh, Pentecost came and that's where we have Acts chapter 2 where you know the spirit of God moved in them and they spoke and they did whatever God wanted them to do they spoke the words that God wanted them to do and changed the world amen and because of their those 12 we have the gospels and many have come to Christ over the last 2,000 years because of those 12 12 uh, servants of God. Amen? Amen. What more will happen in the last days? Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. All right. 
Are we uh, seeing this? Are we are we getting getting the revelation? I hope we are. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. I guess what I get most out of this is uh, those willing to give everything. God will finish the work. God will use those who are willing to do that very powerfully. Though those will face persecution, but it's not us anymore in the sense of, that's why when the uh, apostles and other believers of the early church, when they were thrown into the lion's den and stuff, they were singing praises when they were burned at the stake because they were one already with the with God. They were so connected. They were so at peace. And you listen to any testimony of anybody who's had a, a flat line and gone to heaven and come back. They don't want to be here. So there's absolutely no fear or anything because God's worked all that out. He's gotten rid of fear and fear of man and fear of anything. And so you just have perfect peace, just like Jesus did. Jesus had, no matter what, he, he was a lamb led to the slaughter. He didn't even say a word other than what he wanted us to hear. Amen? Amen. All right, Amen. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're repeating the pattern, right? Jesus, we saw how he lived for the Father, did the Father's will, Became, sat at the right hand of the father as kind of a bride and the son and all that and now we the church this is our mindset is to have that mindset let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus who being in the form of god did not consider it robbery to be equal with god that's a hard thing to swallow right there right i mean for us but we are children of god and he is going to make us like him. In that sense, we are part of the family. And that's why we can be considered, well, we're, the, we're children of God. That's why we have authority to cast out demons right now, right? If we claim the authority of Jesus Christ and we're being attacked, attacked spiritually, demons have to obey, amen? Because we are children of God, which we have that authority. And we use the authority of our head, which is Jesus Christ. But made himself of no reputation, that means ourselves, our minds should be in this. Making of himself no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. For us, it's about obedient to the point of letting every part of ourselves go and he be in total control. Amen? Yeah. And that's a real challenge, is to ask God to reveal to us what part of ourselves are we still hanging on to. Amen? First John chapter 2, verse 6. He who says he abides in him ought to himself walk just as he walked. So this is evidence right here. If anyone says, I know Jesus, and I'm, I'm already sanctified and all that, then you got to be able to pass this test right here. Are you walking exactly as Jesus did? That's a big, big claim if you if you think you do, right? Uh, who can say that but someone whom God has sanctified? And there's evidence, right? Amen. And I know today God definitely made sure that will let me know I'm not there yet. Amen. Praise the Lord. As if I didn't need to know that or didn't already know that. Second Thessalonians. Now we're going to close with our Opening verse, because now I hope we can see this opening verse in new light. Therefore, we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling, of everything we talked about today. Amen? Praise the Lord. And fulfill all good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. Like the Father was glorified in Jesus, may Jesus be glorified in us, and us in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for, uh, for just showing us the cycle, how you work, and your, your pattern is consistent in the Bible. In everything you do, it's not something... It, it, it reveals your character and what you do and how you are 
you you have the father and the father was lonely and so nothing else was worthy so from yourself you brought forth your son and now you two have a relationship but now jesus who's heart was the delight of man and gave himself for man now will also re receive the same blessing and us uh, through jesus that we have your spirit and we too will become one the marriage of the the king and his bride is coming lord and that way we will all be as one and your name will be glorified on earth and in heaven in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Praise the Lord. For everyone here, for everyone online, and those in the future, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you all, amen.